All right, so yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Samantha. I am um, part of the uh, Code Pink's Latin America team. Uh, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Uh, and thank you to our panelists uh, for joining us today as well. Um, as most people are already aware, this is a really important event. Um, given the recent attacks on uh, Brazil's democracy by fascist groups. Um, so today we have a really great panel of speakers uh, who will uh, discuss a little bit more in depth the current situation as well as uh, the events that led up to this insurrection um, that we saw on January 8th. Um, as most people already know, a group of uh, supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro attacked and ransacked uh, Brazil's presidential palace, the Supreme Court, and Congress. Um, days uh, after uh, President-elect Lula uh, Inácio da Silva was sworn in. Um, and of course, this latest attack uh, on a progressive government in Latin America is definitely not something new. Um, it's something that uh, we've been seeing uh, throughout Latin America. And um, with the most recent attack on, on the government and on democracy um, being in uh, Peru, um, and um, yeah, so we have these three really wonderful guests uh, who are all calling from Brazil uh, to give us more information, some more context. Um, please put your uh, questions on the chat as um, our guests present and we'll um, go over them after um, they speak. Um, so we're going to uh, get started with our, our first guest. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our guests already are familiar with her. Um, Camila is always on the ground. She's always covering um, social movements and, um, and giving us uh, news, live news from the ground and what's going on in context. Um, Camila is the editor of Casacha News uh, and Press TV correspondent now reporting from Sao Paulo. Um, so Camila will begin with a, an overview of the current situation uh, as, as well as uh, any latest news and um, touch a little bit on uh, the recent uh, calls to extradite Bolsonaro and what has been uh, the US's response. So take it away, Camila. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for having me, uh, Code Pink, Samantha, and Michelle. And um, it's great to be on with Giovanni um, and Gabriella. And in some ways, I'm sure they know a lot more than me. I'm not some sort of Brazilian expert, nor am I Brazilian, just a disclaimer. But I think it's a really important country for us as Casacha News and the other outlets that I work with to cover. I've been doing coverage here for Press TV. Um, since, well, on several occasions in the last year, including throughout the election process. And editorially, I, I believe it's a really important country, a really significant country in terms of world powers and the sort of uh, program that Lula has and the vision he has for this country uh, as far as Latin American uh, integration and just the project of bringing people out of poverty um, and ending hunger in this country generally. So. Um, I was asked to give a little bit of a news update or recount what happened on Sunday. So I guess we'll just start with uh, January 1st. Um, I traveled with the social movements and a lot of other people did. It was a historic inauguration of President Lula da Silva. Lots of people wanted to be in Brasilia for his third inauguration as president. So hundreds of thousands of people traveled from different states of the country. And of course, we saw lots of dignitaries and a large number of presidents um, and prime ministers and other high ranking officials from around the world went to participate in this very important inauguration. It was uh, attended widely by social movements, by indigenous peoples, 
uh, and you know, representatives of communities and Afro-descendant peoples, unions, of course, uh, Lula da Silva comes from the union movement. And of course, uh, the Workers' Party, but many other uh, parties from the left of the spectrum were there. And you know, because of all of the different threats and uh, you know, even paranoia or some of the what people have considered to be political violence that's taken place during the campaign period and the sustained so-called protests or demonstrations held by the pro-Bolsonaro sectors uh, who refused to recognize the result of the October 30th election, there was a, a large amount of really tight security around the inauguration. And that was part of why a lot of the social movements traveled to Brasilia in an organized form to camp out, to be there, was to ensure that nothing went wrong. Um, and nothing went wrong. It was very uh, overall uh, peaceful and the inauguration took place as planned. Um, and so a week later, which was Sunday, um, on the 8th of January is when we saw the storming of the Esplanade um, by, if you ask the social movements um, and the leaders uh, of so the Workers' Party, the PT, Gracie Hoffman, for example, it has been characterized as an invasion by fascists, by even terrorists uh, against uh, the democratic institutions of the country, against democracy, against the sovereign will of the people to elect their leader um, and elect their government. And of course, it's an attack on the political project uh, that brought Lula to power this third time. It's an attack on the social movements um, and the projects of the most uh, vulnerable sectors of this country that wants to see um, the country go in a different direction than it has been in the last four, four years under Jair Bolsonaro. It was not only an attack on one individual, Lula da Silva, and his ministers. So Bolsonaro had actually been absent from the, um, from the country before the inauguration. He was given advice to flee the country. He chose to go to Florida because uh, his advisors told him that as soon as the government changed hands, that there would be a great uh, chance that he could be arrested for any of the number of things that he's being investigated for, um, different uh, cases. And so he decided to leave the country in advance. He didn't participate in handing the sash over, the presidential sash over to Lula da Silva. So he was absent from the country, but questions remain. Uh, as to what sort of influence or direct or indirect role he had on what transpired on Sunday. So what transpired on Sunday? Um, in the early afternoon, uh, essentially buses of people dropped off a bunch of these pro-Bolsonaro uh, supporters, many of whom have uh, been participating in the different camps, the different protests going on around the country. There's been a protest camp that by now should have been completely dismantled at the army barracks in Brasilia. But there were many other uh, similar protest camps at the different uh, army barracks around the country, including here in Sao Paulo that lasted several weeks and other road blockades, particularly in the Southern states like Paraná and Santa Catarina, uh, which are pretty much known as Bolsonaro strongholds and where a lot of the governors and local officials haven't really taken action to dismantle those camps. Um, and so those sorts of people came to Brasilia, not Brasilia residents. Uh, people were bussed in to take part in this uh, invasion of the Esplanade and what is called the three powers. And so um, a big march took place throughout Brasilia they ended up there at the Esplanade, which is the location of the Planalto Palace, the Supreme Electoral Court, and uh, the, uh, sorry, the, and the legislature, the Congress. Um, and so the police were there, of course, and they were shooting tear gas, um, almost like a joke. I mean, I don't even know how to characterize it because I've been, I've been in tear gas situations and experienced repression by police uh, many times in different countries and it can really disable you if it's really strong tear gas obviously there's different types of tear gas there's also like stun grenades and different things that the police can use 
And if you watch the videos, because the people who invaded these buildings were streaming on Instagram, they were live, um, it looked like a performance, like nobody was actually hurt. You didn't actually see people trembling or getting like severely injured because there was no repression because the security forces were not in fact doing their job. As we saw when this huge crowd of people, thousands of people, maybe someone has the figure, were able to enter uh, the Congress, uh, the palace and, um, and the Supreme Court. So in no way were they impeded. Uh, that was considered by uh, Lula's government uh, to be uh, incompetence by, by uh, those in charge of security. Um, those in charge of security in Brasilia, um, well, around the country are the state governors, the state governments. And in this case, um, it was someone who, you know, uh, essentially was collaborating by allowing this to take place as, uh, you know, a pro Bolsonaro uh, figure. And eventually what happened later on was that uh, Lula had to decree federal intervention in order to get the situation under control, which it was uh, put under control very quickly. Um, it only lasted a few hours. So in the entry, the storming of these different buildings, there was multi-million dollar damage, including to art pieces, to chairs, to people's offices, um, obviously the exterior of the buildings, shattered glass everywhere. Those videos of the aftermath can be seen online. Um, there was one incident in, in, where, in which some of the people uh, invaded a intellig security intelligence room and they took weapons, which is said to be something that they would have needed some information to be able to do that. Um, there's uh, sort of suspicion that they might have been uh, given information to go there and take those weapons. They set fire to things as well, but they were they were sure to take those both lethal and non-lethal weapons out of that office. Um, during the course of, uh, you know, everything that took place, which was a few hours, journalists were reported being beaten, uh, having their cameras and things uh, and belongings stolen. Um, and there were no deaths, but there were a lot of detentions, not necessarily immediately, of course, because um, for a couple of hours, they were just going at these buildings and absolutely uh, destroying them uh, with basically nobody, nobody there to intervene. You could see on some of the viral videos online that were posted by the Bolsonaristas themselves that police were just kind of standing, you know, alongside them not really acting. And in some cases, they're actually, you know, helping them. Um, and so in no way were they, uh, you know, doing their job of protecting uh, these buildings. Um, and so Lula was out of town. He was in Sao Paulo, in the interior of the state of Sao Paulo, in an area that has been damaged by heavy rains and mudslides and where people lost their lives. And so he had been uh, visiting that emergency area and so it was a Sunday, there was no, no one in session, no one was working in these buildings. So in that sense, nobody was hurt, but Lula uh, had a press conference and he announced uh, the decree for federal intervention in Brasilia and said that uh, people will be swiftly, uh, well, they will commence investigations swiftly and that there will be uh, punishment for the acts committed, the acts of vandalism, um, and some, some, uh, in some cases, violence and worst, um, that those uh, investigations would uh, be open right away. They also announced that uh, several states around the country would be sending in extra police officers to Brasilia to secure the capital. And in the first night on Sunday, a couple hundred people were arrested. Uh, by the next day, it was like 1,500 people were either detained or were being investigated, some of whom are continuing, are still held right now. Um, they're denouncing currently like rough conditions. Um, they're basically saying things like we're being held in like a concentration camp and stuff, but they're live streaming and they're on Instagram and they're actually showing images of the food that they're being fed while in detention. And it's the same food that we were fed when we were in Brasilia 
um, the social movements camping out for the inauguration. So it's like perfectly fine food. Um, and so in the investigations that are commencing now, they're asking who has financed this. I mean, a lot of the people who took place, who took part in the distraction are not, I mean, it's just very clear that they couldn't possibly be, you know, the masterminds behind this. Some of them, you know, have been duped and misled into participating in these acts. Um, and so, you know, they have looked into immediately the first day they had the list of the names of the people who had financed the buses that should people in. I don't know the, the number of buses, but, you know, this was something that was obviously planned and orchestrated. And, um, you know, what Lula has said and others um, in his government and around him have said is that they suspect that who's behind this is, you know, the sorts of uh, businesses that are behind Amazon, deforestation, illegal logging, illegal mining interests, agribusiness in general. And, you know, it's a, it's a larger question of not only who uh, financed what took place on uh, Sunday with the storming of these buildings, but who generally has been providing uh, that sort of material support for all the different protests we've seen around the country, who has sustained for so many weeks these camps, and there are videos online that show that they're not, you know, they're not camping it out like really rough and, you know, just having a, a minimalist time. They, they're having a cookout, they're having barbecues, and they're having really nice cuts of meat. And that's all been demonstrated. It's kind of just like a big party for them when they're doing these so-called protests against the election result of October 30th. And so, you know, that leads to more uh, suspicion that this could be linked to agribusiness and like the sorts of uh the sorts of people who could provide you know these different things that they need to be able to camp out for so long you know tables chairs it's kind of like a really a nice setup that they have going on and so um this is all going to be um investigated now and so then sunday or monday well on sunday uh the social movements uh convoked uh, mobilizations around the country in response. And so Monday we saw massive mobilizations in all state capitals, but also in smaller towns and places around uh, the country. I covered the big mobilization here um, on Paulista Avenue that marched throughout uh, the center of Sao Paulo. And it was just absolutely massive. It's not just like so-called petistas and people who are supporters and members of the Workers' Party that Lula belongs to, but a lot of a lot of organizations, football, uh, anti-fascist fan clubs, like Santos, like Corinthians, uh, and a lot of other organizations, count countless organizations, it was very large. Um, and I have colleagues who, who covered uh, similar large uh, demonstrations in other uh, parts of the country, uh, repudiating uh, these attacks on democracy, attacks, attacks on the project that they voted for, but they didn't only vote for it, it's what they mobilized for and brought to power for those um, elections. Since 2016, uh, you know, that's kind of been the slogan around the country has been to bring Lula back to power um, since the coup took place against Dilma Rousseff. Um, you know, a lot of Brazilians feel that this is the only person who can bring such a broad uh, section of the population together in order to uh, get the country back on track. So the question now is if Lula is going to, to what extent Lula and his justice minister and his government going to sort of crack down on everything that's taken place. A lot of people have been able to hold these road, road blockades and these so-called protests and try to cause damage to the economy. Um, and they represent you know, a far right, uh, more radical section um, of the population. And you know, they haven't been really arrested or uh, there hasn't been a big response to them. Obviously Lula has only been in power for a week and a half, but now that all of this has happened and has you know, uh, escalated the situation in the country, and Lula has a lot of support, both internally, he has a lot of legitimacy. He convened um, all of the uh, state powers on Monday. He met with uh, all the state governors and vice governors. They all came to Brasilia to meet. And it seems like he even has a little bit of support, um, I mean, to use that word loosely, from even, you know, 
political leaders of other parties that are typically against uh, Lula and everything he stands for, because people don't want to be associated with this level of violence uh, and chaos. They want to you know, start this new uh, presidential term on the right foot. Uh, at least cooperating on some minimal level with Lula. And so it seems like he has a lot of space to potentially pursue these real, you know, real prosecution of these different people, not necessarily the people that they bust away to, uh, to the stadium or wherever they're being held, but finding out who actually has supported these different acts and uh, bringing them to justice, assuming that a lot of these people are, uh, local business owners or those sorts of people and not international. In terms of international, then um, they're looking into, of course, in what ways Jair Bolsonaro himself, because these are, of course, all followers of the ex-president um, and his allies in the exterior, so they're basically all in the United States, in what ways they have played some sort of role um, directly or indirectly. And that's when we get to the extradition uh, of Bolsonaro from the United States. Um, the State Department did directly address this uh, this week. Well, not directly. He couldn't say there, he couldn't say Ned Price, the State Department spokesperson could not actually name Jerry Bolsonaro and he couldn't speak to his case, but uh, a couple of different journalists tried a couple of times to press Ned Price on this issue. And essentially he came he traveled to the United States. He's been in Orlando and Miami, I believe, on a 30-day visa as a, as a head of state, as a diplomat or head of state, which is its own distinct visa. Obviously, now he's no longer president, but because he's not in the United States for any official business or reason, he, like just about anyone else, will have to go through the process of um, seeking to uh, renew his status, prolong his stay there, um, have some other reason to be in the United States because that uh, the status that he's on currently will expire, even if he's in the hospital or has some health condition that he's receiving treatment for. And of course, um, there are some calls being made from uh, members of the U.S. Congress and other U.S. personalities about uh, questioning, uh, you know, the Biden administration on why this person is allowed to be in the country and calling for his extradition. There's going to be a lot of people here in Brazil calling for Bolsonaro's extradition so that he can uh, face uh, justice here in Brazil. Uh, but it's unclear, you know, but Biden and Bolsonaro are not exactly allies. So it's unclear how that will all go down once his visa expires. We know also that members of the Bolsonaro family have been seeking um, citizenship and status in Italy and trying to go other another route. Uh, but the Italian prime minister, who's far right, also uh, denounced the storming of the capital. So um, it's unclear what options Bolsonaro has and for how long he'll be able to stay in the United States. Uh, but those calls for his extradition are beginning now. So I'll hand it over to you guys and hopefully we can circle back with more questions later. Thank you uh, so much, Camila, for that uh, wonderful overview. Um, it's very clear that uh, Bolsonaro, I mean, um, that Lula has support um, internationally, and it's great to hear that um, he has uh, a lot of support nationally as well. Um, and uh, so now we're going to um, be speaking um, with um, Camila, I mean, sorry, um, with Gabriela. Gabriela is also a journalist uh, and she is calling in um, from Brazil as well. Um, thank you so much, uh, Gabriela, for um, being here. And um, yes, she will be speaking a little bit more about the response from, from students and, and social movements and um, yes, you can um, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Samantha. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. So good to be with Camila and Giovanni. Um, I know they work, their work is so great. It's so good to talk about it. And I guess it's so good to talk about it um, with a North American 
um, community and space because the first thing uh, that we said, like I was with a couple of friends, we were actually <laughs> enjoying carnival because no one expected this to happen right now. As Camila said, it was something that the, the, the attempt of coup happened uh, without actually a trigger, you know, uh, we, nothing really happened. We haven't, haven't had any, any, any problem with the government, no bigger news. We only have had, uh, the nomination of ministers and secretaries of government. So nothing was really happening and was not, and there was no trigger. So we were actually joining our first, um, week of vacation in four years as social movements, I guess Giovanni knows that we haven't stopped working in four years heavily more if you count the last elections, which was very, very, very hard and very difficult in 2018. So when it happened, the first thing, I guess, we we all looked around and said, like, this looks so much as the attempt of coup in the capital, um, the capital in the United States, which has recently uh, completed a year, I guess, and two years, Giovanni, thank you. And so this comparison was like inevitable. And we started talking about how we have in Latin America and the whole world this rising of the far right movements or the fascist movements. And that there was no, no news in Brazil. Like Camila has said, we have had this campings out uh, of military unities uh, all around Brazil. We have them in Sao Paulo here where I live. I've seen them in other states of Brazil um, very heavily in Rio de Janeiro where um, Bolsonaro is from. So we knew that things were not um, pe peacefully being held here in Brazil by the, the, our opposition. But at the same time, we, we were kind of managing it. Uh, I guess Lula was trying this first moment, this first week, this first few days of government to work and try and work and try to organize the house because everything was so messed up. Uh, we have had the transition government, which has worked for the last two months. Uh, and they have brought us um, a, a description of what, what was going on inside the government with our fi the government finances, especially. And we were, we were confronted with the fact that the Bra Brazil was broken. And then we had so much work to do. And, and there was so much work for the government to do and so much work for the social movements. And I guess Lula was in this first moment trying to organize everything, choosing its ministers, having its first um, discourse. And, then, and it, was not, it was not being held right away, the fascist groups movements. I, can't, I guess it was kind of expecting it to go away by its own with the progress of the government. But uh, since January 8th, uh, we have seen a shift. I guess it was the opportunity for Lula, the government, and also the social movements to start um, going and trying to talk about it, like directly. I guess uh, at the end of the day, it was a very violent movement, was a very violent attempt of coup. But, and we had so much destruction, as Camila has told us, um, so much works of art and it was so so shocking but at the same time it kind of inverted the the discourse in brazil because even many people who used it to support bolsonaro you could see in the social media that people were against it even a lot of fake news emerged people saying that there were people who were um hired to destroy everything there were people from the left wing and they were not um real bolsonaro supporters and and that kind of thing but all those fake news have been uh, dismantled the last few days in which is very very good that the, the their discourse and their narrative is, are not being held and through this the social movements have been um pulling a campaign against amnesty for Bolsonaro, his family, people from the government, and also the people who have participated in this attempt of coup. So we have shifted the, 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 the situation. And I guess it has become a, an opportunity for us in Brazil to talk about what has been happening, to talk about fascism in Brazil. Lula, in his first, first time 
he spoke publicly publicly after the event. He he already said this is a fascist movement, and which was very important us for it to give it a face because we have been talking about fashions in Brazil as social movement for four years, and we it was so hard to illustrate that to the society. And they have done it for us. They have shown us what fascism is, what is uh, this far right can do, what is uh, political, um, how do you say it? Political um, opposition, that, uh, 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 illegal opposition can do, what a uh, uh, far right position can do. And it has been shown us and then, um, um, on the 10th, we went to the streets. In Sao Paulo, we had 60 to 70,000 people on the streets. We're so much more than were in Brasilia. So we could show them that we had a big support, a big support for the government. It was so important for us right now to show uh, that the government is not working alone that the social movement and the, the other party, the other left wing and center parties, they are all, and also a few right parties who even Bolsonaro's party has spoken against this movement. So no one is actually backing it up. And that's why the investigations are so important uh, for us to understand and give the names to who has done it, who has ordered this attack. Uh, but the social movements have been uh, using it very well to talk about the situation in Brazil and also in a more um, talking about justice and talking about what has been do been doing, the government has been doing. You know, Lula and the Supreme Court have been clearly been working to, to take this opportunity to dismantle these campings, to investigate people, to to um, also, for example, I guess Camila, Camila didn't mention this, but uh, I guess today or yesterday, yesterday they have arrested 50 um, police officers, officers from Brasilia who have been, who had been, should been, should have been working that day. And then as we saw from the videos and the recordings, they were not, they were like being very easy on the protest, protesters, the coupes, the terrorists. And these people were arrested and have been, and now a huge investigation it has been done. A lot of uh, requests for Bolsonaro extradition, for Bolsonaro investigation, and his part on everything are being held. So we know that a lot has been, has been, is being doing that we thought we were going to take a longer time. I don't know if Giovanni agrees, but I thought the investigations and all of our our work as a social movement and all of our, the progress we want to make, we're going to be done uh, in a few months, but they are been doing right now because of this, the situation that was presented. And I guess um, we are in, in a state of alert as social movement tomorrow uh, is programmed another um, manifestation in Brasilia from the social movements, the left wing parties and progressive people. They are going to go to Brasilia to make a, uh, a demonstration to, in support of the government against the coup, against fascism, which is also very important. And we have like, we have a great uh, amount of people organized and ready to face the next steps that we have to take. Also, we had a many, many, uh, demonstrations of of the supporting the government. We had them internally. Um, I was uh, on Monday in a um, act that was promoted by the law school of the University of São Paulo, which was very important. With many people who actually had already in in August, last August, made a letter to to the Brazilian people talking about democracy, talking about the importance of defending our democracy. They were reunited on Monday to reinforce the, the position against the coup, against fascism in Brazil, saying how much it's important for us to support the government right now and to make it uh, hold strongly as we are as we are doing. And also we have we have seen many support uh, supporters from um, many other countries, many par other parties, uh, presidents, leaders who have talked um, 
on behalf of the government saying that they were against this kind of demonstration, that they support Brazilian democracy. This it, it happened with Biden. Biden talked talked about it. He called the Lula and they had like this. Lula is a figure, I guess it's also important for people to understand who Lula is in Brazil, who Lula is internationally. It, which is a figure that represents dialogue, the frequency, a figure that represents um, this, this midterm between uh, social movements and rich people in Brazil and, and the agro and the the and all the sec the social sectors we have. And he has always been very successful in maintaining a good diplomatic relationship with everyone, every country. And that's why during his government, Brazil had an increase in its participation in the UN, for example, in very many other organiz uh, international organizations. We have ha had uh, a lot of construction uh, in our region, Latin America, in the South America, we have been, the, it got stronger as a region economically in its political um, relations. And that's why he also represents um, a new a new moment for Brazil, and he's going to use all his this political capital that he has, this this possibility that he has to reconstruct the country in a different way, in a way that especially people from the rural and these people who Camila has said are destroying the Amazon forest and are exploring in a very in, in a legal way actually the the nature resources of Brazil in, and it represents a, a, a problem for a lot of people, you know, a, for this kind of people and from, uh, and that's why we need to investigate who's behind this attempt of coup and this attempts of, of, of dismantling the government. And I guess a few things that happened that are very important internationally since we're talking here with people from other countries. It's how, for example, Lula has re-entered the CELAC, I don't know how to say this in English, but it's the Latin America community, Latin American Caribbean community. And also recently the president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro was in Brazil for the inauguration. And he had a very interesting interview, I guess a lot of people have seen it, uh, which he talked about how the left wing has re-emerged in, in Latin America. We have uh, many presidents from left parties and progressive thinking uh, parties, and, and it has been crowned with the election of Lula, and which represents a lot of change for the region, a lot of change internationally as the region talks to the entire world, because with Brazil, which is the biggest country, not only in its size, but also economically in the region, it means a lot of power for this kind of organization, for this kind of political relationships. And Gustavo Petro was here and he talked about this new moment for Latin America. And he talked about how important it is for us to uh, develop our country and develop um, Brazil. And that's the kind of thing that Lula represents. And it's exactly the kind of exactly the opposite of Bolsonaro has done the last four years, which was to destroy our any kind of so, so sovereignty we have in Brazil, or any kind of uh, independence we have as a country in our economic relationships and our finances. And now uh, Lula represents a new chapter, and it's very threatening. That's the word I was trying to remember. Very threatening to many groups. And I guess we are going to have to stay. Um, focus as to to respond as this kind of thing happens, but um, I guess as a as a whole, the government and the social movement have been answering and responding to this this event very very rapidly and very assertively, which is very very good for us and very hopeful. And I guess this is it. I guess I've used it my minute the minutes I had. And thank you so much for the invite again. Thank you, Gabriela. Um, and for um, for our guests, for our attendees, um, please remember to uh, put your questions on the Q and A, um, and we will get to them uh, towards the end. Unless you have a specific question for um, one of the speakers. 
Um, so now um, we will um, be uh, hearing from our last uh, guest speaker, uh, Giovanni. Um, Giovanni is an internationalist by passion. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in, in international relations and is doing his master's in world po political economy at the Federal University of ABC um, with a research on international security and geopolitics of the Amazon basin. Uh, he's an activist and part of the national coordination of uh, the Movimiento Brasil Popular. Um, so, Johnny, you can take it away. So thank you so much, Samantha. Thank you so much, Gabriela and Camila, Michelle, for having me here. I don't know if I have any more contributions considering the brilliant and precise analysis already made by uh, Gabriela and Camila, but I can try something here. I think the, the first thing, considering everything that we already discussed here, is that when we elected Lula in the last in the last year, we were saying that the Lula's election would be just the first step to defeat fascism. This is important because this is what we are seeing nowadays. This is the reaction of the fascists, you know, against the result of the elections. So we can expect more and more things like this, movements like this. And in fact, I, I can, I don't know if I can say that, I, I don't know if this is a consensus, but I think, in fact, Bolsonaro is not the only leader of those, those kinds of movements. In fact, I think now Bolsonaro is a leader, of course, because he has this reference with these groups, but now we have different fascist groups being created since the beginning of the Bolsonaro's government. Of course, we have this as a society in the history, but considering the Bolsonaro's government, it uh, was a government to create, to mobilize, to stimulate those kinds of groups and to deepen the fake news, to deep the process against the women, against the indigenous people, against the LGBT, well, everything we already know this history. So the first thing I think is important to, to understand that our threat here that we are facing, as Gabriela mentioned, is not a, a new thing in an isolated case. We can see this kind of connection of attack, attack against the, the democracy in many parts of the world. We can see in Peru, as we are seeing nowadays with the dictatorship of all the coup that is happening there, more than 47 people just one month were murdered. Come on, this is a extremely attack of the far right against the people's democracy, against the people will. So also it's the same that we can see the, the, the supporters of Trump in the United States, the supporters of Le Pen in France, the supporters of the Fratelli in Italy. So we can see a kind of connection of the, the far right connected internationally. And here in Brazil, we have two kinds of leaders. In one hand, we have Lula, and I really think that now considering the response on Monday and including on Sunday, but then on Monday, then all the support from the Supreme Court, the support from the legislative, the, 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 the support of all 27 governors of Brazil, including the, the right go the right wing governors that were in Brasilia with Lula together. So I think it's a kind of second inauguration of Lula. We can put, I think we can put in that kind of level. We need to understand if this movement can be consolidated, the second inauguration. I think it, we need to see the next steps and the, the history that will follow us from uh, now on to, to understand how that can be consolidated. But we have Lula as a leadership of a national union against the fascism. We have this kind of, and we have this position, I think Lula is being recognized as this leadership internationally. And at the same time, we have the uh, leadership of the fascists. In fact, he's in Florida, in Disney World, we know that, but uh, we know that we, here in Brazil is a kind of stage that we can see two very different <laughs> 
uh, types of leaders. In one hand, against the fascism, in the other hand, one of the leaders of the fascism in the world. So I think as a first comment, I would like to, to put on, on this as a scenario that we are living here in Brazil. So, but what is the difference that we can see of the supporters of Bolsonaro, considering when Bolsonaro was the president and not that he is not anymore? What is the difference for, for the, the tactics, you know, in terms of strategy and tactics? What you, we can see in terms of tactics of those fascist movements? I think now they, they, they fully support a coup. They are fully supporting a military intervention, as always they, they mentioned. But when you have the, the government in your hands, you can put this kind of agenda of military intervention with different levels. Now we are facing a different scenario to them. So I think we can identify three main uh, movements, aesthetics, move, tactical movements of those uh, fascist groups. The first one is the permanent destabilization of the Lula government. So what we saw in Sunday, we can see in other moments, we already seen on social medias, on those groups, we can see all the same thing. We need a military intervention. So the second thing is to establish a military intervention. This is the, 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 the way how to solve in their mind the problems of the dictature of the judiciary in Brazil, as they mentioned. And, and the third one is the un annulment of the political rights of the leftist parties and leaderships. So it's a total fascist agenda. And the other hand, in our, uh, in considering the people's mobilization, we have other kind of agenda to defeat those agenda of the fascism. And here, considering the people's, the, the Brazilian people uh, agenda, we could, uh, what we, I don't know what you think, uh, Gabriela, uh, about that, but what was heard most in the streets on Monday, the day after of the attacks in, in Brasilia, what was heard most was no amnesty, no amnesty for Bolsonaro, for his supporters. So there is a, a public will to see the people be identified, who are the responsible, who is financing all this process, who in the parliament is part of that, who inside the government, inside the institutions are being supporters of those groups. So there is a, a public, a feeling, I don't know, that there is a, a spirit in the air that we need to, to move forward. We need to identify and penalize the people. And considering the reality of the Brazilian society, that, you know, we have the armed forces here uh, as uh, being part uh, in the historical moments as part of the coup d'etat. <laughs> we could see that during all the, the republic, the, the, the period of the republic in Brazil, of course, and also the dictatorial regime in the last century, and also there's the same idea now. So there is a kind of difficult, I think, for Lula government to, to face what we call here a military issue, because it's not a simple task to do that. We have, you know, years and years, centuries and centuries, the armed force being part as an institution, of course, of the country. They have the arms, the weapons in their hands. And we really know the armed forces and also the public security means the police. The majority of those men and women support Bolsonaro's idea, the fascist idea. That's the reality. So there's no possibility to have a, a strong and only one measure of Lula to, to solve all the problem. So there is a complex issue with many, many layers that need to be uh, faced. Uh, to, to, first of all, I think the, emer the emergency, there is an emergency question is to isolate fashion. The, the measures took by Lula on Sunday and Monday can hold, uh, can help us to understand that now, the fa now, just now, the fascist movement, the fascist supporter are, are isolated. But it, it, it can be different in some weeks uh, after of all of this. So we need a 
permanent, a permanent mobilization of the people, a permanent mobilization of the government against this, this crisis, against the fascist groups to identify and to condemn them, to penalize them. There's no possibility to negotiate with the fascism. I think this is the, 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 the clear message that we need to think when we are seeing all these days. And when I'm saying that the armed forces is a complex issue here in Brazil, just to, I don't know if this is everyone here that is listening us and seeing. Thank you for your time again. And thank you, Code Pink, for this conversation. It's amazing to have this kind of exchange. Brazil, United States, and all parts of Nuestra America together discussing that. But in fact, we have the public support of the armed forces. Why I'm saying that? Because in one hand, we didn't see, we didn't see any, only one general saying publicly, condemning what the, the camp of the fascists in front of the barracks. So we saw camps since the, the end of the elections, the results of this, the, the second, the, the second, not second term, the, the, the second election, I, I forgot, second round, the, the, the end of the, the, the second round, we saw fascist groups camping during 70, 70 days in front of the, the barracks and, and they did nothing. They did nothing. So they are part of that. They are part of that. Think about if it was a different group of leftist groups saying different things in front of the, the headquarters of the military facilities. Things about the destiny of those leftist support uh, groups. So it's different, it's different. So, and, and more than that, the most updated polls published by Atlas Inter, you know, this is a, it's a big data company that provide us some data. And they, they, they offer yesterday, one, one poll provide the data that 80% of Bolsonaro's voters support the military intervention in Brazil. So it's not a, com a common thing, considering that Bolsonaro achieved 58 million votes in Brazil. So it's hard to, to do the thing. It's not a, a, a easy going situation that we are facing. That's why I really believe that the response, the people's response, the Lula's government response, this national union government against the fascists need to think in the short term, but in the middle and also in the long term, because this is a long uh, path that we have in front of us to dismantle all of it. So I think that I think the the we we could see uh, the one thousand five hundred people being arrested, and more than seven hundred are in the jail now. So this is the the data, the spirit of the things. Then in, and it's also curious that these people that now is in the jail that their entire life they 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 were against the human rights. Now they are calling, asking for the human rights because of their situation in the jail. So we are saying, we are seeing uh, this, this thing here in Brazil. And I really believe that we need to, to pay attention in all of it because what Lula's government is trying to do is a national union government. As Gabriela mentioned, Lula has these characteristics. Is that good? A good, uh, is it going man that, have the negotiation, he puts different parts together and trying to combine a common strategy to move forward. In fact, because of this, many times the left-wing organizations protest against Lula because sometimes he, he made negotiations with people that the left-wing do not agree. But this is part of the, the, the process to be the president in a capitalist country, I think, yeah? So uh, I think it's also part of all these processes, as I tried to mention here, and trying to explain the complexity that we face in terms specifically the military issue here in Brazil. I think we have uh, the, the, the president that have the, the best conditions to move forward a plan of unity, a national union of the institutions. So liberal is very, the idea is so liberal, in fact, because 
we, we need to support the liberal ideas when we are seeing the rise of the far right, yeah? So this is a kind of tactical movement that is important that I really believe that we have the conditions to move forward, but in fact, this need to be a movement, a permanent movement of mobilization of the people on the streets to express people's power, people's support of this agenda of identify the responsibles and penalize them. So now the Brazilian organizations, the people's organization here in Brazil are calling for a national, a national mobilization next Sunday in Brasilia again. So trying to move forward a permanent agenda on social media, on the streets, on parliament, on all kinds of institutions to, to mobilize the support to this agenda, to defeat the fascists permanently. So it requires us this, this energy, this effort of bring together the efforts of all kinds of political uh, spectrums. Since then they can put together the, the, the force against the fascism, the power against fascism. This is very, very important to move forward because in fact, I don't have time now to explain more. I, put my, my, my attention on the challenge of the military issue here in Brazil, but we also can put the, the second challenge. I think Lula has two challenges in front. Now we are seeing because of the, 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 the recent, the, the situation on Sunday, the military issue, but also we have the economic issue specifically the neoliberal agenda in Brazil. This is other part of the same coin of the fascism as the professors Utsa and Prabhat Patnaik from India, they mentioned to us the strong connection between uh, neoliberalism and neofascism nowadays. We have the neoliberal agenda getting worse the conditions for living. It, it means for the people, of course, for the majority, and then it means fear and a fertile ground to spread fake news and the fascist ideology. But this is a other subject, but it's also important to, to point that Lula has two main challenges. One is the military issues that could be explored by what we could see in the last Sunday, but also at the same time, and part of the crisis, the social crisis in Brazil, the neoliberal agenda put by the financial market. But this is other conversation. Thank you so much. Ah, and just one thing that I saw a question and answer box here, why Gabriela mentioned a new movement of Lula nowadays. Because of that, Lula, this third governor of Lula, now there is a specific characteristic because we are talking about the government after Bolsonaro and it means a government of reconstruction of the country. So this is why it's a new moment because now more than ever, it, it's a moment that requires us generosity, to put together different groups of the politics to defeat the fascism. Our difference are not overcoming our will to defeat, isolate and defeat fascism. I think this could be a good start to answer that. Thank you so much, Samantha. Thank you, Giovanni, for um, the very thorough and um, complex um, overview that really just like situates um, what's going on in in Brazil just to um, a global issue and the, uh, I think it's uh, really great this connection that you made between um, neoliberalism and fascism I think um, that it really does go hand in hand um, and the fact that um, uh, you know that fascism was not going to be defeated by an act uh, just by uh, Lula, but it will um, need a strong social movement and taking the streets and organizing. And I think um, that applies not only to Brazil, but um, it's a lesson that we can also be uh, taking here, um, as well as other parts of the world where um, there is threat um, uh, of fascism and, and the rise of fascism. Um, so thank you uh, so much, Giovanni, for uh, making all those connections. Um, and it looks like we do have um, a number of questions here. Um, and thank you for um, answering the one about um, the new movement of Lula. 
Um, uh, here we have um, David Paul. Um, what has the military been saying and what do you think they will be doing forward? Uh, because I understand many government powerful positions are made up of military from the last government. Um, so uh, I'm not sure um, who would feel the most comfortable uh, taking up that question. I already spoke a lot, so Gabriela, please, or Camila. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to say that Giovanni has already addressed this question a little bit, talking about uh, what's the, the profile of the military wing in Brazil. So it's very hard. I I am a master and I think a candidate in the in in you in the University of Sao Paulo, and I have been studying in my masters dictatorships in Latin America. And what I can say about it is how we have a heritage, very strong heritage in Brazil from the dictatorship. So it's so the military wing, it's very, very hard to to, to organize and to di to dialogue and to talk to with the government. And it has been throughout all the gov governments we've had since the redemocratization. Re and so, uh, but the last government we had, the Bolsonaro's government, were four years where this happened, exactly in the question. We've had many important, um, non-related to military issues, posts in the government occupied by military, the military. And right now, Lula has already changed a lot of that. So we've had I, many ministers who were from the military. I'm, I'm not going to say numbers here. I'm so bad with numbers that I never remember. But uh, we have already had this important change and we've had so many changes in secretaries of government and this has been done uh, very effectively by the new government. So I guess this is uh, something that we're going to, this, this has been been working on. For example, we have the um, a organization, a, a government organization that deals with the issues of the indigenous people in Brazil, which is called FUNAI. And it was very, it was occupied occupied by military in the last few years, which represented um, a huge problem for our indigenous people rights and our protection, uh, the protection of the land in Brazil, in the Amazon forest, in the actual entire country. And it, this has already been changing radically we have new people who are who are now constructing this organization, which has actually also changed its name. I don't know if, even if we say Funai anymore, because but we have now it's called the Organization for Originary People, Originary People, and so I guess we have seen a lot of change. And Lula uh, was someone who, in his previous governments, talked a lot to generals and to people. Mm, in the military and he has been able to for example do a lot in in for example investigating crimes in the in the victim brazilian dictatorship at the same time as he kept, uh, yeah. uh, for my, uh, more as he kept i guess oh it's okay uh, and he as he kept a dialogue an open dialogue with this 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 part of the society but at the same time we cannot deny the fact that of course we have had a, a major issue that was not addressed, that we try and silence this, this group through the last um, governments before Bolsonaro, which were which were to Lula's government and his successor Dilma, who, who ruled for six years. So uh, we now have to kind of repack with this this heritage that we have, not only the from last century, but from our last governments, our last um, governments from Lula and Dilma, that we have had this kind of this this problem growing inside of Brazil, in which was not dealt with, and now we've seen in with Bolsonaro's election and Dilma's coup and the last four years how they are still a very strong holder of power in Brazil and they cannot be underestimated and they have to have a a uh, I guess the government has to 
prioritize the like dialogue. As I, I, I very much agree with, with what Giovanni has said about this being one of the greatest issues that Lula's new government is going to have to face. The military situation, its relationship with the military um, leaders and everything. And so, I don't know, I don't know if Giovanni wants to add anything, but I guess this is what I had. Do you have anything else to add, Giovanni? No, no, no. This is precise, precise. Thank you so much, Gabriela. Um, yes, I think um, it is very visible that um, this will be one of the, the biggest issues that um, Lula will have to face in his new government. Um, here we have um, another question uh, from Clark Joseph. Uh, is it true that 95% of the wealth of Brazil has been confiscated by 5% of its people? I think this question gets to the issue of um, inequality and um, in Brazil, just as um, is the case in a lot of Latin American countries. I really don't know the exact number, but in fact, Brazil is one of the most unequal countries in the world. So. Of course, we would be, I don't know, the, as I mentioned, the precise uh, percentage, but in fact, we can see will be an absurd, a tragedy, of course, this, because we have a rich country, as you know, water, land resource, a natural resource, a lot of people, and a good market to, to sell things and to exploit too. So, I really don't know the number. Sorry about that. I was not prepared for that question here. Maybe Camila, our most updated uh, comrade here, can explain that. I don't know, Camila, if you know this information. Oh, not I. No, I'm, I'm half in Peru land mentally right now, but I wish I had that information for you. But it sounds to be, you know, like it seems like that's largely the case in all countries, right? I also don't know. All right, thank you. Um, and Clark, I, I'm i sure we can look that up on Google at some point. Um, and um, here we have another question um, by Stephen Matten. Um, I just read the 200 page executive summary of the January 6th committee in the US. Is some similar investigation possible in Brazil? I mean, I, I don't know if that if it's the case that something like that will take place here. And I think it's really important that as much as it is very important to draw the connections between different countries and the far right and how it's articulating and growing and that sectors are radicalizing, that Brazil is its own distinct country with its own uh, distinct process and uh, political entities. And I think it's very serious um, and distinct that there's a far right here that is receiving perhaps material support and being inspired by external interests. And that was not the case in the United States. In the United States, honestly, I would be very cautious about calling what happened. I don't know what the position of Code Pink is, for example, but I'd be very cautious about what happened in the storming of the Capitol um, in Washington calling that a coup because those were really like US citizens that stormed one government building, uh, you know, whereas in, in Brazil, it was three buildings. They have total disrespect and contempt for the Brazilian institutions and democracy here. And, you know, I, I do think it's, uh, you know, I, I know that the polls have come out even right after uh, Sunday polls came out that showed that 90% of the Brazilian population don't agree with the storming of these buildings. Um, and, and so, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that all the people who voted for uh, Bolsonaro and who, you know, essentially lost in October that they support this. But, um, you know, we, we do have to remember that this is genuinely a popular government that was brought to power by years of organizing by the grassroots. And that's not uh, the case in the United States. The United States is a very corrupted 
um, and very elitist electoral system in which third parties aren't able to exist really. You don't really have third parties in most of uh, government, including on the state level uh, throughout the country. And that this is a country, the United States, that systematically disenfranchises voters to this day, in which people can't vote on the basis of being black, in which gerrymandering exists, and all sorts of other things. It's so deeply anti-democratic to its core, uh, the political and electoral system of the United States. And so I, I'm not trying to give legitimacy to the people storming the Congress in the United States, but I am just saying that uh, perhaps instead of right-wing supporters of like, right-wing talk radio host or something storm, storming the Capitol. It could have also been Black people storming the Capitol or, you know, like sort of like Black Lives Matter uh, supporters or some other group. There are a lot of reasons why citizens of the United States might feel justified in sort of carrying out these sorts of acts against police stations, against all sorts of different things. It's, it literally is um, an authoritarian state and a dictatorship that you live under there in the United States. So um, I don't think it's the same. You literally have uh, you know, billionaires in the United States that are financing anti-democratic acts in Brazil. And I think that should be the real concern. Um, what happened here truly undermines uh, democracy because this is a country that has potential to even have a revolution in the near future. Whereas the United States really is not at that point because it doesn't really have uh, social movements um, and mass movements that have articulated in the, on that sort of level doesn't really have that ideology among uh, any of these different sectors uh, that exist here in Brazil. So, I mean, that's just the one thing that I have to say because, you know, I've been un invited on to a lot of uh, radio programs and different interviews and stuff like that, or a lot of, you know, they're trying to draw a lot of similarities between the two things because of course in Brazil, it was a copycat action in some sense. But I do think that, that, that the two um, processes are quite uh, distinct. And you know this, this idea that there are people perhaps in Florida that are financing uh, terrorism here in Brazil, just the way that people in Florida have been financing terrorism in El Salvador, in Cuba, in Nicaragua, and in Venezuela, I think it's something very, uh, severe that puts this on another level. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Camila, for making uh, that really important distinction about um, the two countries and different political process um, that we have are completely distinct. I think uh, I think it's really important to bring that up, considering that our mainstream um, outlets are are you know making a very strong case about uh, comparing these two issues and kind of just glossing over the nuances of um, the distinctions. Uh, Giovanni, did you wanna say something else? Just a, a brief comment considering that question because it's important to understand that now the Congress in Brazil is in vacation, you know, it's on vacation. So they will start the work on February. Since the end of this month of January, it means the vacation, we will have this federal intervention being applied because what Lula decree mentioned is the federal intervention, the deadline of the federal intervention will be the end of this month. So considering that all the process of investigation, penalize and all the process to investigate all of it is in the hands of the federal intervention. So as people's movements, we are looking forward for this kind of possibility to move forward the investigation. And in fact, on February, once the Congress could start the legislative year, we can we, we would like to see in the day one or the first week being, uh, being created a parliamentarian commission of inquiry. I don't know if I can say properly in English, but here in Brazil, we say, Comissão Parlamentar de Inquérito, what is called a CPI. That is just that process of the, the, the MPs discuss and investigate all the process. As we saw during the pandemic, that the Bolsonaro's government faced that kind of commission. We would like to see the same commission by members of parliament discussing, investigating, and penalizing. 
it can also move forward and could mobilize the news, mobilize the outlets, mobilize the people with daily information, you know, considering this kind of investigation of these commissions. So it's a kind of TV show that daily we can see new information, new names, new people try to find to identify the responsible for that. So we are looking forward for this kind of investigation, of course, but until the end of the January, everything is in the hand on the hand of the federal intervention. It's not possible to have a member of parliament uh, commission yet because they are on vacation. We are facing that situation. So in February, we would like to mobilize this kind of energy to have this commission be installed. Is that uh, thank you, Giovanni, for answering that question. Um, and uh, we have um, a few more questions here, which are um, very similar. Um, uh, is defund the military an option in Brazil? Does the military have independent sources of income? I don't think that's a possibility. <laughs> it's a public budget. It's the Ministry of Defense, the things, and also military. There is no independent or autonomous source of, of funding. Everything is public budget. And in fact, during the Bolsonaro's government, we saw an extreme rise of the budget of the defense in, in Brazil, you know, instead for health, education, and so on. So now that's why I mentioned Lula has the military issue, not just considering this task that we are mentioned, but also considering the money, because we need money for public health, education, you know, uh, the housing and so on. So also it's a, a, a thing that Lula is facing to, to, to put in a lower level the budget of the military. Yeah, I think um, that is also uh, an issue we are struggling here in the US um, where our budget is absolutely ridiculously high. Um, and but your budget is a half of our uh, GDP. Think about that, the half exactly. of our GDP. So imagine the uphill battle we have over here. Um, and yes, of course the US is also funding um, militaries abroad, including Brazil's and Colombia's and um, every other country. Um, all right, thank you uh, so much to everybody for, for staying with us. Um, I have one more um, action item for everyone. Uh, so, you know, as um, most of us already know, um, Bolsonaro is still here in the United States, um, enjoying his time in Florida as um, his followers um, completely um, destroy in um, the, the democratic uh, process of Brazil. Uh, so we understand that different sectors of Brazilian society have taken to the streets um, and are calling for uh, full accountability for the coup perpetrators um, and including uh, the extradition of um, of Bolsonaro back to the U.S., which um, the United States is um, capable and has the right and the responsibility um, to do um, in order to collaborate with the investigation. So we just have one action item over here uh, calling on um, our supporters and everyone to to continue pressuring um, Biden to, to listen to these calls and to um, cancel the visa of Bolsonaro so that he no longer has refuge here in the United States. So I'm gonna put the link on the chat and uh, please uh, sign the petition, share it on your social media um, and talk to your families and friends about it because it's it's really important issue and it's something that here in the United States we can be doing um, to be supporting the, the people of Brazil and their demands. Um, yes, and I just wanna thank everyone for, for, for being here tonight and for our wonderful guest speakers who have done an amazing job at just um, giving us such um, good information uh, about 
what's going on in Brazil and um, what is the difference between the January 6th insurrection here and um, the the attack on democracy on uh, on Brazil. Uh, so thank you uh, all so much. Uh, this um, webinar has been recorded. It will be uploaded to our YouTube um, and will be shared widely. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you, Samantha, for moderating. And thank you, Michelle. Thanks, guys, for the invitation. Good night.